Hello everyone, my name is Pierce and welcome to the very first episode of Korean Cinema Talk. Korean films have seen their popularity explode around the world over the last two decades. Yet for many viewers, Korea remains a foreign country with an unfamiliar culture. For viewers watching a film in a different language, subtitles are a necessity. Joining us today for this very first episode is a very special guest. His extensive work translating subtitles has drawn praise from those who've had the pleasure of reading his work on screen, but also those fluent in Korean who believes he captures the many nuances of the films he translates. Welcome very much to Darcy Packets. Yeah, it's great to be here, Pierce. Darcy, you are uh, a man who wears many hats. Yeah, in my time in Korea, I've been lucky to have been able to do you know, a wide spectrum of different work. Another thing you do, of course, is uh, you founded the Wildflower Film Awards. So I just thought it'd be nice to have, I mean, similar to the British Independent Film Awards or, or something like that, to have a, an event that would be focused on Korean independence. And we had our seventh edition this year. But today we're going to be talking about another aspect of your career here in Korea, which of course is uh, subtitles for Korean film. How many have you translated at this point? <laughs> I need to count. And, I mean, typically I'll do about 20 films a year these days. And so if you add it all up, that's, I don't know, 150 if you include proofreading and everything else. You've become quite famous for having uh, translated a very little film called uh, Parasite. <laughs> yes. There are a lot of people who uh, do this kind of work. I'm sure they have different ways that they go about doing it. What is your uh, general process for translating? You could divide these into different stages, like there's kind of preparing for a translation, which usually I don't spend a lot of time doing that. But, you know, sometimes if, if a film is based on a certain book or something, or if it's set within a certain historical period, it might help to kind of read a little bit about that period first. Sometimes I get to meet with the director in advance, too. In those cases, it's interesting to hear their thoughts about the characters themselves, and hearing that in advance is sometimes helpful. I prefer to have like a week or a week and a half to do the, the rough draft, which I just go through slowly on my computer with a video file. And then when I finish the rough draft, I, I do make sure to go through it again and to spend more time, if at all possible. I think the quality of the translation really improves the second time through. How has, uh, from the time you started doing this work, has your process changed very much? Uh, there are some cases where the director wants to meet with me and to sit down and to go over the subtitles together. Particularly the, the famous directors seem to want line-by-line -line discussion. So with Parasite, we spent two days. We were at an office at CJ. There was a big group of us there. It was me and the, the producer and I think four people from CJ and the director. And, uh, there was a, a technical guy who was on the, his laptop kind of typing in the things, that, the changes that we made. But obviously being able to talk to the director and ask directly is a great advantage because Translation involves a lot of creative choices. Mm. So I'm curious, you, you mentioned that this two-day process for, for doing the, the final stage, the feedback stage with the director for, for Parasite. You know, Bong Joon-ho has such interesting details within his film, and, but some of them are hard to translate for cultural reasons. Sometimes it's just a linguistic play that is hard to do. And yeah, so often it's a case where, you know, if sometimes, you know, I made a creative choice and then the director says, well, actually, I think it'd be better to go in a, a different direction. So we, we come up with a different translation together. The film will be translated into other languages. As far as you know, how does that process work? One thing that does affect the translation into other languages is that often they want to keep the same spotting. So the timing of the subtitles, you know, where you decide to divide up the sentences. Can you explain a bit more about what spotting is? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of an art in itself that's separate from translation. So in some countries, you do have specialists who do the spotting before the translator even sees it. And then puts it over. Basically it's just deciding like if there's, I mean if there's a long sentence for example like where you're going to divide it up. Often if two characters, if there's this kind of quick exchange of dialogue between two characters rather than do it in two separate subtitles you stick it up in the same subtitle. I think that, I mean in Korea it's standard for the translator to do that kind of spotting themselves. But what about with particularly the, the difference between Korean and English? It's uh, the, the grammar and the syntax can be very very different. Exactly. A long sentence can be the English and the Korean can be completely reversed in a yeah. Sense. Does that affect how you how you do that? It should affect it. And I mean, recently I was watching a Korean show on Netflix. I won't say which one it is, but the translation was quite good. But actually, the spotting there were issues with spotting. And so, for mm. example, a character would be speaking and would suddenly express surprise on their face. But then, you know, the subtitles were divided in two, and you'd end up getting the crucial information either too soon or too late. Mm. You have to always think about when to transmit that information mm. to the viewer in terms of what's happening in the scene and in the performances as well. If you've done 150 films, this means that you've translated several films for several stars. Are there any actors who are easier or harder to translate? Yes. 
I don't know if you'd, it's not a criticism, but the actor Cho Jing, I've ended up translating quite a number of his films just by coincidence. He has a very particular style of delivery where he will, he doesn't pause in the middle of his sentences. He speaks very long stretches of dialogue with no pause in the middle. And so for viewers watching this, for the Korean audience, it does give a kind of energy to his performance. But as a subtitle translator, it makes it really hard. I mean, I, because usually I like to, to divide up lines when speaker pauses. Mm. You recently did this uh, a really wonderful tutorial on the art of making uh, subtitles, which was uh, in collaboration with the Wildflower Film Awards. And you mentioned about spotting there and one thing in particular about how sometimes it is good to cut from one subtitle to another on an edit, like cutting from a shot to another. In France, for example, it's something that for many years has been considered a very hard rule. Although it becomes much more harder depending on what kind of film it is. And if there's, if it's a fast, paced style of editing. You know, if it's one sentence and it's cut within four different parts, it's really awkward to watch that on the screen. Mm. You know, I do think that from the audience's point of view, usually you know, they're not thinking about this, and they may not notice as much, and so it is fairly common in Korea to put a subtitle on the screen, to leave it on the screen, even as different cuts are being made, mm. and, and not to kind of change every time there's a new cut. But again, on the other hand, if, if it's possible to do it in a way that feels natural, then it is a more smooth viewing experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing that happens sometimes is that if you have a film that has multiple languages, for example, with The Handmaiden, I think this was director Park Chan-wook's idea, although I'm not sure about this. There's an instruction at the beginning of the film that says Korean dialogue will be subtitled in white and Japanese subtitled in yellow. Mm -hmm. uh, so that the audience always knows, even if they don't speak Korean and Japanese, they'll know when people switch from one language to the other. If you don't have something like that, then you know occasionally within the film it's kind of important if there's a moment where they do switch languages. And uh, you mentioned The Handmaiden, working with uh, uh, Director Park chan -wook. What kind of preparation did you have to do for that? I, for, I know you, you would have read the book at least. I know, the first thing they said to me when I got that job is, oh, you have to read the book. <laughs> and luckily I'd read the book previously because I knew that this movie was coming up. I thought I'd just take the chance to, to read it in advance and I'm glad that I did. The other thing about that translation was that he specifically wanted to use particular lines that had appeared in the original novel mm. and he had and the director read the novel in, in translation and yet they asked me to get a, an ebook copy of the film so that I could search easily for specific lines of dialogue. You know, obviously there were a lot of changes that were made in adapting this film but there were specific lines of dialogue that consciously took from the novel and so you wanted to be precise, as precise as possible in doing that. And so uh, aside from reading a source novel, what has been the most preparation you had to do for before starting uh, embarking on a, a translation job? I mean often it's with Bong joon -ho. He again is more so than other directors very focused on, on details. He understands the subtitling process quite well and he also I think is very good at seeing things from the perspective of the international audience. So in, in that case I just I got a big list. They asked me to read the, the screenplay in advance. I got descriptions of different characters, relationships, thoughts about about, you know which difficult phrases you know, should be perhaps translated in a creative way. In terms of how you begin a translation, I believe, again, from your video, there are different kind of schools of thought on that, shall we say. Yes. So uh, there are people who will want to uh, read the script or see the film several times before watching it or not know anything at all. Where do you land on that? I've heard from people who say that, oh, at I have to watch the film at least three times before I start a translation. I'm completely the opposite. I prefer to watch a film completely cold, partly because I think it helps pull me through the process. Like getting from the beginning to an end of the film involves a tremendous amount of work. If I'm excited to see how the film is going to end, that's one thing that kind of keeps me going. And I'm going to be going back and re-watching the film over and over again anyway. So in that sense, I don't think it hurts the translation. But also it's kind of interesting to be seeing a scene and experiencing it for the first time and then immediately translating it because I'm experiencing it in a similar way to what the audience would be experiencing it. That, that sounds like it makes a lot of sense. I have to admit that if I were in your position, particularly for a film that I was kind of very excited to watch anyway, I'm not sure I would have that kind of diligence. <laughs> I've gotten to like watching films incredibly slowly. <laughs> and part, it's kind of fun to be one of the few people in the world who will watch a movie over the course of a week. Nobody else will do that, I think. So, so you might be the slowest movie watcher in the world? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I think we're going, to leave it, we're going to leave it there. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed uh, today's, today's talk and please join us next time. We're, we're going to keep talking uh, with Darcy again about some more, some more details 
uh, cultural aspects of a Korean film translation. Uh, please uh, be sure to like our Koba's YouTube channel and uh, like this video, subscribe to our channel, and uh, please leave some comments. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you for watching.